So you've come to learn about character design. Um, it was my hope when I decided to give this thing, I'll tell you who I am in a second, I just want to let you know what you're in for if you decide to want to sit out this hour, um, is to do a celebration of everything involved within character design. And if you're someone who's just learning this or just interested in this pipeline, you're going to walk away with a ton of buzzwords, a lot of stuff to be able to go back and YouTube later on, and um, yeah, to be able to follow up on. It's going to go really fast because when they tapped me to do this, the Georgia Media Workshops did, um, I listed out a big list of things and all the different steps that are involved in getting a character from concept into game. And the email I got back was, okay, sounds good. And I was like, okay, let's, let's see if we can do it. And so I gave myself a personal challenge to see within two weeks if I could take a character from concept and get them all the way through into moving in animation. So I hate tutorials online when you look at them and they don't show you what the end product is actually going to be. So we're gonna start here. Uh, well, let me do my introduction first. So I'm William Moritz. Thank you very much for coming and listening to me talk today. I've been a professor at the Art Institute for six years. Um, I'm a freelancer right now. I'm a subcontractor for Bosch and redoing all their saws and heavy machinery and stuff and doing the 3D modeling and product design for that. Um, I've worked in the gaming industry before. I came back from San Francisco to be a creative director when I was very young uh, for a celebrity interactive gaming company. And gaming is one of those things that it is an absolute passion. And you've got to have passion to be able to learn all these crazy steps that I'm about to go over uh, with you today. But hopefully this will be fun. We're, the character that I chose for this, his name is Pip. And I didn't want to pick like a AAA looking guy, something like from Death Stranding. Or Again, in two weeks I was doing this character. So I don't have time to do all the haggard old faces and all the pieces of armor and everything. And we don't really want that for today, I don't think either, because what we're really looking for here is a very simplified character to be able to take a lot of steps and just focus on that. If he had a bunch of armor and stuff, it might get overwhelming, it might get too distracting. And we just want to take a bare minimum, you know, Mega Man 11 just came out when they released it. It's 3D, but it's still a 2D side-scroller. And I think that there's definitely a resurgence in this style of character, this height of character appearing within indie games and other gaming platforms. So here's where we're going to end up at the end here. All right. There's Mr. Pip. That's how I felt at the end of it. There you go. It's just hustling about. We'll explain to you who, who Pip is here in a minute and why I chose these particular animations here. So there it is. That's where we're heading to. How do you get to this phase within animation, within gaming? At this point, once it gets to this level, um, I've got the animation baked out. All the keyframes are in there. I can export an FBX and import it directly into Unity. It's got its texture files, which are all baked and separated out. And those can just be applied within there. And you're going to be good to go. All right. So you've got your actionable move sets that you can do. Right on. So here is what it takes to be able to get Pip into the move stage. So from concept into game. In the beginning, in step one, we've got the game concept. What the heck is your game actually going to be about? Um, after that, you start developing who the character is, what the look, the style, the world building, which is one of the, I think everyone, especially if you're just getting into this, is one of the most interesting, interesting portions of game design. After that, character reference, uh, we'll, and we're going to do a little deep dive and just sort of skip rocks over each one of these. Um, after that, character sketches. Get a bunch of different looks and feels for what your character is actually going to feel like. After you get a character reference going on and you get some character exploration, um, then you're going to want to do them in a lot of different sketches, a lot of different poses. Test this guy. Make sure that you know what he looks like from every single angle. Um, after that, you can jump right into ZBrush, and you can start building your character. From there, it gets crazy. You're going to start doing a back and forth between ZBrush, Maya, and today I'm using Substance Painter. So before we go any further, let me explain that I know there are a lot of other pieces of software out there that you can use, and like Marmoset, you can use um, Retopo or Topo Gun. There's all kinds of different pipelines for this. This is the one that I happen to use today. So if you're more familiar with one, I think what you're going to find is that the overreaching themes are still the same 
for all these programs. So if you are writing any of this stuff down, and, and I see you take down some notes, again, that's Maya, ZBrush, and Substance Painter are the big three that I'm going to be talking about uh, within this following presentation and where we're going with it. Okay? So let's do the uh, get the fun stuff in there. So Pip is a Victorian street urchin who becomes a legend. That's one sentence, one phrase, and instantly we've got an idea of who this character is. That's it. It's summed up in one sentence. We know where we're going. You've got the picture. You've got the artful dodger in your head. You know, we, we've all seen characters like this before. How do we iterate and expand upon that world? So, you've got an idea of what you want your game to be about. This is Victorian era London, so this is not a good time to be a street urchin or an orphan. Uh, this picture on the right really did a lot for me when it comes to getting the direction of what kind of world Pip is actually existing in, right? It's, it's not the prettiest thing. He's sleeping on the streets, but he's still a smart kid. So within the game, now you can start thinking about, you know, what are the mechanics? What do I want to accomplish within this game? So learning to rob uh, for his gang would be a part of it, and also learned to like rob for his keeper at some point mid mid game boss he overcomes the guy who's in charge of his group of rascals and takes over the gang or something like that whatever you want so from there you can start to get some interesting things the mechanics of the game and start thinking about this from the very beginning initial concept is this a stealth game so does pip have to walk around and be stealthy when he's stealing from people all of a sudden you start to get a resource management type game so what kind of items is he stealing what does he get to do with those things once he steals it is he stealing stuff, selling it, where do you sell it from? And all of a sudden this world, just from these couple initial ideas, really starts to come to life and starts to build. All right, so now I'm starting to get an idea in my head about what the environment is for this world, right? So we're thinking Victorian London, steampunk, always popular, right, and forever. You've got lots of smoke, you've got dark city lights, you've got people in trench coats, shadowy figures, and you start to get sort of a color palette going on here with those earth tones. So that is why I ended up going with the color scheme that I did for Pip, because I wanted him to be able to stand out against those dark kind of London gray bricks and streets. So character references, and this is something um, that when I was a professor, I, I stress to the utmost degree. If you are going to be doing drawing anything, even if you get a sheet for your company that you're working for and it says, hey, we need a carrot for this game, by God, Google images of carrots. Because you're going to have a picture of what a carrot is in your head, but we have the internet. It's 2018. There's no excuse not to look online and see other ways that carrots have been represented. And it's going to give you a lot of different ideas. So going into this, I began with costume references, trying to get in the mood, trying to get in the feel for Victorian London. You know, what were the little kids dressed like? Because I really had no idea. I mean, I could kind of pull it out of my head, but once you actually start doing the, the groundwork and just some fun quick Googles, um, you're going to get a much better idea. What do the haircuts look like? What was the predominant little boy hairstyle during this era? Because they weren't wearing the white wigs or any of that stuff. Like, you know, we know what the, the fellows look like, but as far as kids, where did they exist in society and how were they seen? So now, going on to the costume references number two, I'm starting to pull a little bit more, right? I'm starting to look in here, and we've got pictures of this gothic kind of looking kid, uh, very noir with the wolves, right? You've got Sherlock and, and Watson. You've got a steampunk robot with the Doctor Who red scarf on. And all this is just sort of informing me about I'm, I'm having conversations with it while I'm looking through it and collecting it. If it's interesting to me, I want to save it at this stage and say, okay, maybe this could be a background character. Maybe this could be someone else who shows up later on in the game. Maybe there's something in here that I could pull and use and it's gonna influence my design decisions down the road. What I'm trying to say is that we're keeping it very, very broad at this point. From there, I wanna start narrowing in my focus and really getting an idea of what type of character I actually want to draw, right? I kinda of already knew that I wanted to do a three heads high character and maybe I'd see something online that would change my mind. But at this point, like I said, going back to the carrot, how have other carrots been represented? So here's just three quick photos, a sort of a street urchin, a beggar, some a salesman, very different styles. At this point, I could have ended up doing something like this. I think this would have been fun. This is a really relevant style that's going on in this world nowadays. But and a lot of times, you get the little innocent 
uh, looking, looking beggar fellows, the little sad boys, puppets, puppets for the poor on the street. And, uh, but the one that I really liked is this one that is very, very much off model from anything that we had in, in here previously up until this point. But what I loved about it was the relationship of the head scale to the body and the sass and the facial expressions that they were making with this character. Because I started thinking to myself, like, you know, finally it's time to start drawing. I started thinking, like, okay, so maybe he is the good old boy, uh, you know, thief with a heart of gold that the audience just falls in love with. Could work. Next up, a different character style altogether, sort of um, adventure time, or just sort of that, uh, I, I don't have a good terminology to describe it, but you know what I mean. There's a style of animation that's pretty prevalent right now. Um, and, and working within that world and to see how that might work. But I thought he looked like a little bit of a doofus and I didn't like that one particularly. So on the second one, now we get into sort of the, the two big guys. I really love the one on the right. So he's got kind of a gypsy pirate king type feel to him. And then the one on the left is the one that I ended up going with because I felt like he was aspirational. That if he's a street urchin during, you know, in London during the Victorian era, and he's trying to rob, he's trying to con people and things like that. He can't come off as this little innocent fellow. He has to have some kind of like dapperness to him. He has to like want to aspire, be able to at least like try and fit in with the upper class or however a little kid might try and do that. And that's what I want his costuming and his kind of demeanor to reflect. So I, I felt like uh, this was sort of the strongest one to go with. And this is a great stage if you're working in a gaming company to sit around and have a roundtable discussion about which, which way you should actually go. It'll save you a lot of time to get all those feelings out there on the table instead of three months down the line when you've got a full 3D character and they say, oh my gosh, no, well, if we actually make him a pirate king, I think this might work a little bit better for us. You don't want to end up in that situation. So talk about this stuff with your entire team, your friends, get the feedback. Art does not exist within a vacuum. So here we go. We went with this, we're going from sketch into the color and the exploration. Now, if you're doing this in a studio, you're going to do hundreds more of each one of these, these steps. You're gonna do a ton of different exploration drawings and sketches, you're gonna put them in every situation you can. The more you do, the better your character is gonna be, the more life you're gonna breathe into him. Um, you can see that he's getting a little bit off model, but the first one, let's go back up here. Each one of these steps is important. On this guy, He's got the little Madonna gap tooth, all right? And I really like that. I thought that gave like an innocence, uh, sort of a, a youthful demeanor to the character that in this first drawing of him that I had, you can't see his teeth. You don't know what the inside of his mouth looks like. And so I wanted to go back and apply that to this character uh, later on. So you're learning things from every little step and every little section along the way. So now we've got the color, but video games nowadays, we know you get to pick the colors on your characters in almost every game that you play. So later on down the line, you can have the programmers change the pants color, change his hat, he can buy in-game gear, he can you know, look like a peacock by the end of the game or be running around in a, in a spider pig costume. Um, but for here, this, this stage is really cool if you're a designer because it's the one where you've made all these decisions and all these choices up until this point, and then you go back and you second guess yourself. I think as designers and artists, we're always second guessing our, our designs and saying, am I doing this right? Does this really look good? But when you start changing up the colors on the character and putting him in all kinds, of changes, you know, change his hair to black, changes his outfit or blonde or whatever. But if he still keeps the same look in every color choice that you put him in, you're like, dang, he still looks cool. I like this. He looks pretty hot this way as well. Then you know you probably have a pretty strong character design. If it starts to fall to pieces as soon as you change one color on it, um, it might not be the strongest design in the world. I'm thinking of Superman right now, but when you put him in all black, uh, he looks pretty cool too. So. so just to reiterate the steps that we went through here, we've got <laughs> looking at the costumes, getting the mood and the feel for who our character is, building in the personality, again, from the central and the beginning sketches. After that, looking at archetypes and how beggars and children beggars have been depicted within art before, and where do we stand in relationship to that? Do we want to carry on the regular archetypes and what a beggar has always been within art and media, or do we want to add something new to the ongoing narrative of that? Um, character shapes, looking at all different heights and styles. What is our, our final look and feel going to be like? 
and then getting into the details and the attitude and exploring different color options. So once you've done all that, you know who your character is, you've got your exploration going through, and it's a good time now to jump into ZBrush and begin modeling. So for anyone who is new to ZBrush or has used ZBrush before, these are some, if you know ZBrush, this is gonna, you're gonna go, oh God, yes, this is the stuff that we deal with all the time. If you're new to it, write those words down because that's gonna be the stuff you're gonna be Googling later on, I guarantee you. So Z spheres, what the heck is that? Well, I'll show you in just a second. Hitting T, it's kind of odd, but if I could say anything about ZBrush, it's one of the most finicky, unintuitive programs that's ever been created that fills a very important part in the gaming and character pipeline now, um, but there's just some weird stuff to it that doesn't make a lick of sense, man. <laughs> like after you actually draw a character in, having to hit T to be able to modify that that character, like stamp it in there and get it movable and editable. Subdivisions and subtools. If you don't know ZBrush, they, they sound sort of similar. A subtool in ZBrush means a different object. So it means the hair is a different tool than the rest of the body is. Each one of the eyeballs is a different tool. A subdivision is how the topology, the squares, the um, quads that make up the character actually move across it. And with a ZBrush, you have the ability to be able to subdivide your character and take it from, you know, 400 quads up to 4,000, 40,000, and so on. Letting you get more and more detailed as you move. So this is the beginning of PIP within 3D. Humble beginnings. It looks like a stick figure, right? How, if you guys are into drawing, how many folks have you heard say when you tell them you're an artist, they're like, oh, the only thing that I can draw is stick figures all the time, right? So if that's it, then you can say, well, then you can probably do ZBrush. You can at least get started because that's what you're making it here in the beginning with these Z spheres is this type of character. From here, you have to go in and you have to click on something called adaptive skin, which is actually going to turn it into the mesh that you can use. The Z spheres are not the mesh that you're going to end up drawing in. It's going to recreate it. It's going to create a new tool. You got to load that in there. It's just kind of a weird step. But once we've got our mesh in there, we can start roughing in our character. It's gonna look really rough. This is why people, when they're first starting out, a lot of them, a lot of the schools, they'll teach them Maya at first, and the students go in and they're like, oh my God, this is radically different than anything I've ever used before in my entire life. I don't like Maya. They learn about ZBrush. It feels like sculpting with clay. It feels more like drawing. It feels more like a traditional medium, and they gravitate towards it. Even though ZBrush, in my opinion, is got some weird stuff in it for the UI, UX, and the user experience, they love it. So you're going to start sculpting this guy out of clay. Continue with the subdivisions, refining it, adding more detail, getting it to a stage that you like. And once you're ready, you're going to export this fella from ZBrush into Maya. So now we're in the big pool of 3D stuff where you can do the rendering, you can do the animation, it can handle a lot of different things. And they've, it's got a lot of different capabilities to it. ZBrush, mostly for the modeling, you can paint in there, you can do hair, but there's, so this is where the part in the, um, the presentation, it can segue. So you can go into a lot of other programs outside of here uh, to be able to do what we're about to do next, but I wanna just explain to you why this step is so important. So computers, of course, have gotten a lot faster over the years, and they can handle a lot more polygons than they could in the past. But the level of detail that we're seeing within things like Death Stranding and those cinematics and you know the 3Ds that's going on within films, is it's so dense, it's so hyper-realistic at this point, that it would be millions upon millions of polygons. If we're running this in a game engine, we have to have a much lower density polygon count on the character so that the game can run smoothly and we can all be happy with our 60 frames per second. So that's what I'm, my goal here now is moving my character from ZBrush into Maya. When we look at a close-up of this, it's got too many quads. So I'm sorry if this, this light's a little bit difficult for us to be able to see. Hopefully you can see the green mesh that's going over the top of this character. And these lines it doesn't look much like a character at this moment, but these, these lines are way too dense. They're not moving in a way that we'll see in a second. That's really going to be able to allow the character's face to be able to animate, to really be able to get smooth deformation when he's moving around. 
So here's an example of the quad draw process. And I'll show you a little bit more about this in a second if you've never heard of it. What we're going to do is we're going to take our high density model, we're going to make it live, and I'm going to start drawing little squares, little dots. It's just connecting the squares all over this entire character. And we're trying to get a new mesh that's going on. So between the top one, look on the right hand side at his half face, you can see how many squares we've got. And now he's got considerably less. Save that to the end, buddy. Um, <laughs> and what we're going to see is uh, that the lines on the face are moving in a different way as well. And there's a reason for this so that the face will be able to morph and move around. Here's another example of connecting the dots between quad draw. Never seen this before. Here it is. So we start working our way through them. And I'm doing it in strips so that I can just fill in between the different sections. These three green little dots are just little clicks that I made. I hold down the shift button, hold over it, and it's going to put in a, a polygon inside of there. And I'm trying to just, again, limit the polygons on this character. So here's the before. Here's the after when it's smooth. And this is a, a more reasonable representation of what I keep trying to describe when it comes to the flow on the character space for the lines. So this is a cool thing. If you've never seen this before, if this isn't your expertise when it comes to the art pipeline, that blue strip that's going from the character's forehead all the way down to the chin, this exists, this topology method, um, on every type of character you can imagine. So not just humanoid figures either. Even if you look at like some of the 3D models from Zootopia that came out, and you can find pictures of the, the topology forum online, an alligator or humanoid alligator and things like that, if they're going to be talking or moving or really construing their face, I can't think of too many examples of characters that do not follow this pattern when it comes to the topology of their face. They can still have the very long snout extruded, but you're going to have that strip going from the top of the forehead down to the chin. You can look that up later or check it out on your phones right now if you like. It's pretty cool. So there we go. We've re our character. Now, going back from ZBrush, this is another one of those segments in the, in the pipeline where it can branch off and there's various other programs out there that will do it. For this today, I used ZBrush and the UV Master uh, to be able to get my high-density UVs out of ZBrush. So what is a UV? Well, a UV is what's holding and placing the texture information, and it is a flat representation of our 3D character, a flat representation of all this topology that we're seeing on the right-hand side, and it's just been sort of like roadkill. And there's even a program called uh, the pelt pelting tool or roadkill that will take your characters and flatten them out like this. Uh, I don't think that's the one that I end up using in the end, but it gives an example of how we're going to flatten our character from there I can take my flan character with his UVs, already created, and bring it into something called Substance Painter. You like Substance Painter? Man, Substance Painter is everywhere right now, man. I think that's something to really, really get excited about. Um, you know, when I first started with this, you had to draw all the maps within Photoshop, on, and it was all flat and 2D. The cool thing about Substance Painter is, yeah, we've got the flat, 2D representation on the side, but when you're actually working within this software, you're going to be painting directly on the model, and it feels incredible. It feels so cool to be able to do that. On the very far right-hand side of this image, you can see something that's starting to look very similar to Photoshop, right? That looks like mask and layers within Photoshop. They could have made it like Photoshop, where you just create the layers, but unfortunately, it's not that intuitive. When you start off in Substance Painter, you're going to drop one texture onto your character. This happens to be the skin texture. And then you're going to start putting stuff over on, on top of it. Now, the way that this works is you create, you right click on this, uh, this skin texture. It's going to come up and it's going to say, create a black mask. And you right click on it, and then it's going to create the little black mask off to the side. You're like, oh my gosh, finally I can start painting. This is great. I can finally start painting on my character. This is what I know this program does. But for some odd reason, there's a weird step that you have to do. You right-click on your mask, and then you go all the way down to this big drop pop-up that's going to come in. It says, Apply Paint. And you click on that, and that's when you can finally go in and start painting onto your character. And then you start layering it up. There's all kinds of other cool stuff that you can do with this. It works great for objects as well. So within the... 
right? I think we're all, hopefully we're all watching these. I keep coming back to it. Death Stranding, obvi I, I obviously am very interested in that video game, uh, whatever it's about. Um, <laughs> right? So when you, see the, when you see the latest cinematic that they came out with, if you pause it, the backpacks that they're wearing, any piece of metal that they have on their bodies, it's a dead giveaway that this substance painter is being used. Because on the metal, um, you'll start to see the little chips of paint around the cracks and the edges. And this is something that substance painter, when you have good UVs and it's laid out in a smart way, very logically, uh, will create those little chips of paint and that wear and tear around the edges of, of your object. So it's not just for character drawing. It works great for environment pieces as well. It's not just being used in AAA games. If you look at The Force Awakens, the, the first new launch of like the Star Wars films that they came out with, that pirate queen, can anyone remember her name? Maz? Kanata, thank you, thank you. <laughs> so her entire character design, when it first came out, around her goggles, she's got those same little chips of paint. And so this is a program that's being used across the industry, from the biggest Hollywood films that you can imagine to the biggest game designs. It's a really good one to know right now. It's going to be around for a while. This pipeline, this step in the pipeline, is not going to go away anytime soon. So I highly recommend looking up some tutorials if you haven't already. The learning curve on it, Compared to Maya, it's very simple. Compared to ZBrush, nothing compares to ZBrush. That, that program is screwed up. So, <laughs> All right, so there we go. We've done, and the, the, the next cool part about Substance Painter is that it's going to allow you to be able to go in there and you get to export all your different maps. So check this out, right? So here's just some quick details of like what you can get in there and why you might want to use it. So it does felt, it does cloth stuff really well. We can see some micro bumps that are existing in there. It allows me to be, be able to do another layer in here with some dirt. Um, there is a very rapid hair texture that I put on just to have something. And, uh, and then over on the right hand side, I just want to show some other objects flagged out. So this is his hair, but that's the UV map of his hair. Here's his hat, here's his hat flattened out, and that's what it looks like. So this is what this step is all about, the, the underbelly of it, right? We're trying to get a couple different types of textures that we can plug into our character. So all of this is for something else, right? Every single step that we're doing has been to be able to get to that next part. And these are the files that we're really interested in getting out of Substance Painter. There's a lot more that it can export. It can export like probably 13 different maps and you can plug them into all kinds of crazy places. For this example today, we're using a very small collection of maps and that sort of represents the core ones that you really want to be aware of. So of course the color, you spend a lot of time painting this thing, you want it to look good. The specular, which is going to give the way that the light is actually refracting off of the object. Uh, so what's shiny, what's dull, and that makes a big difference for the way that we interpret materials. Uh, deformation map and a normal map. So the deformation map, this is one of the coolest parts uh, for something that Substance Painter can handle. We did all that work to be able to get our high poly character into a low poly format. Within Substance Painter, you've got the ability to be able to import your high polygon character and then bake the map, bake the detail onto a flat 2D image, onto your UVs, and then hold on to that high level of detail and then export that map and then apply it, all that detail in a flat 2D image with black, whites, grays, raised and lowered, or in normal maps with three different colors, uh, showing, yeah, and it's going to work on, on, your, on your lower resolution character. So now we are jumping back over to Maya, exporting this character. I've got my maps and I'm just plugging in the textures. So. Never seen this before. This is what the, uh, the texture library now looks like within Maya, or the Hypershade section. So this is our main material representation, not the most realistic thing for what it's going to look like, but it's being applied to this character. The UVs are the most important part for him. Over here, we've got our different options. This is our main texture within this section. I click on the little uh, checker box within Maya, and it opens up the nodes for me to be able to plug in my texture file, and then I've got another uh, placement node over here to be able to apply this stuff. 
and there we go. All those crazy steps to get a functional character that I can actually start animating on now. But we're not ready to animate. There's some stuff that happens when it's time to animate the character, which this will go on within Maya at this point. Time for everyone's least favorite part of the entire pipeline. Rigging, right? Now, I told you guys from the beginning, this would be a lot of buzzwords, a lot of kind of general overview. We can't go into all this because most of these things, when you're in a university, this is an entire quarter's worth of information that we're just skipping over within an hour, right, for each one of these sections that we're talking about. Uh, rigging is one of those things that if you decide to be the lunatic who wants to fall in love with it, you will find a job. You will go out there and someone will want to hire you because you're doing the thing that no one wants to do. You're cleaning the toilets of the 3D world. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I know how to do it. It's not my favorite thing. I'm not going to say that I'm an expert in this um, in any way, but there is a lot of work out there for this. And over on the right-hand side, we've got some, if you're new to this, some new words, weight painting, parenting, character tools, and facial rig. So. Let's talk about the joints, right? It's pretty cool. I remember seeing this back in the day. Maybe you've all seen a behind the scenes video on like a Disney animated film or something like that. And you see them working with these characters and their joints. They actually do have a skeleton in them. So in a lot of ways, they start to become like uh, a stop motion figure that's got the wire frame on the inside of it, like Kubo or something. Um, and what you end up building within your, your model is a character rig on top of that that's going to be driving those joints. So the joints are attached to the skin, the controls are attached to the joints, and that's what you're going to use. Because if you're trying to animate this guy with just grabbing the joints and moving them around, you've got a big character on the outside and you're interested in what his form is, how he's actually going to be posed. You can't go in there, look at a wireframe, grab the joint every time. You need something on the outside to be able to quickly grab, select, and move around. Now, Maya has included uh, something called the character tools recently, which does great for motion capture. It'll build a full body rig on your character within like a couple, couple button clicks, and it's, it'll give you the IK and the FK buttons as well, but it does not include a facial rig. That would be incredible, right? If you could just you know place some nodes on there and then all of a sudden you get a full facial rig on your character. It doesn't. So for the sake of time within this, uh, this demo today, I used the Maya character builder on the bottom portion of this character and then did a very, very fast facial rig with some controls on top of it uh, to be able to get the guy moving. So that's something that you can do if you are new to this pipeline and you're just trying to get into it. Don't mess with the facial rigs. They're a completely different animal. But you can take Maya's starter rig that they give you, do it in stages. It doesn't have to skin it right away and do all the weight painting on it right away. And you can build in, build up on top of that base rig that they give you, which is what I did in this one. Okay. So now, weight painting. And I think this is probably one of the things that, if you've ever tried this before, has been the bane of your existence. So this idea of weight painting, you've got your bones inside of your body, we've got our controls set up, and we start moving our character, all of a sudden you're going to see that when you move his arm up to the side, you're going to get a huge piece of geometry that's going to inflate like a blowfish. Because all this stuff, these joints on the inside are influencing, and they've got different pieces of the, the, the topology or the polygons that they're attached to. So as the character's arm comes up, that joint is saying, okay, I'm within this region, this white region that you can see on the character. I'm touching and influencing everything in that area. And sometimes that becomes a cloud and starts to pick up some stuff that's not necessarily close to it. So you've got to go in and you've got to pull back the reins on a lot of these joints and you got to say, all right, well, I'm going to paint you out. I'm going to make you black so that, you know, you don't, you're not going to be affecting this area of my model. And it gets really tricky. Every now and again, you'll get a, a stray vertice or something like that that's going to stick out into a triangle and no matter how hard you try and paint around it, you just can't get the little brush to land on that, on that triangle, especially around the eyes and things like that when you're doing a facial rig. So then you have to go into the component editor, and then you got to select that one verse, and it becomes just, it becomes madness. But fortunately, we picked a very simple character here today, so it wasn't that hard to be able to paint. 
So now you've got your character painted, he's moving properly, you've got your rig built, you've made it to the stage where you can animate. What a journey it is, right? Just to finally get to that part where we can breathe some life into our character and get him moving all these steps. So you start animating him. You do, you know, with anim animation, we really don't want to put in too many keyframes at first. We want to keep it light so that we can edit it and stuff has got some type of system with the way that we're putting these keyframes within the animation. Once you've got your animation looking good, you're going to go in and you do something called bake the animation, which you grab the, the geometry, and now all of a sudden the geometry is going to get baked in that position where it's no longer dependent on the rig. You can export these animations into a plethora of different things, but it's ready to be exported as an FBX into Unity, and you will be able to, uh, to make your character run in that point. Phew, we did it. So let's check him out one more time with him moving. Yeah, that's how I felt. So let me say one more thing about these animations. Um, I ended up using something called Maximo, Mixamo. I've never really heard it said out loud before. Um, if you've never heard of this website, uh, it allows you to be able to take your model, preferably in a T pose instead of the way that I built him, and um, you'll go into it and it's all online. And you set up some quick bones, you tell them where the wrist is at, where the center of the chest, where the pelvis is, and then you hit go on an FBX or an OBJ file, and it's going to take your character and then apply a bunch of motion capture data or animation information to it. It's owned by Adobe, it's free to be able to use, and they've got a hundreds upon hundreds of libraries for animations. So for you game developers, you programmers that might be sitting in here today, if you're hiring an artist, if you're paying them some money, consider, depending on your game, that they don't have to animate everything. Some of these you can just pull off a of Maximo and save yourself some cash and just use those animations. It's got some cool features to it to where it allows you to be able to go in and when you export it, it'll do the baked animations. But you can also export it to where it tries to limit the amount of keyframes that it's giving you within the file so that if you do need to go in, you need to modify it or you need to make it more about your character or he moves in a slightly different way, um, you have that ability with less keyframes. It's not so much junk or trash. Um, so, yeah, something to keep in mind. So, guys, I'm William Moritz, Georgia Media Workshop. If you'd like to learn any more about this process and what's involved in it, please look them up online. They offer uh, short classes on the weekends, and uh, we'll do a deep dive for three weekends in a row on a Saturday and, uh, and really go into some of these topics quite a bit deeper and really give you a mastery of them um, and a skill set that will help you get hired. So thank you so much for listening today. I appreciate it. And uh, can I get a clap? All right. That was a lot. All right. Thank you. <laughs> if you've got any questions, we're at 239 right now. Please stick around. I'll answer them uh, until 3 o'clock. And yeah, if you want to try any hot sauce, you're more than welcome to come up and do that as well. Yeah, just come up here and just ask. Yeah, that's what I say. Yeah. Not all at once. <laughs> yeah, just come up and hang, man. Oh, yeah, I, that's one of the hardest parts. That's a great question. So you wanted to know what are some beginning steps to get into 3D modeling if you're just starting uh, from absolute scratch? I think the hardest part for that is figuring out what the heck you actually want to model because we see the stuff like Death Stranding and things like that out there that are these high density models, you're going to try it, you're going to go up against this Mount Everest in 20 years worth of skills and you're going to fall flat on your face. Now it's cool to keep trying to you know, climb Mount Everest, but at some point you have to get in the climbing gym and you just got to boulder around, man. And that's what I'd recommend. So when I first started doing uh, 3D animation it was way back in the day when AOL used to come on like floppy disk. And I remember using like Poser and Bryce 3D and Rhino 3D when it was in beta. And all these programs were just getting start, were starting out. 
And each one of them allowed me to be able to learn how to be able to move within 3D space, how to be able to quickly create an object, how to be able to apply texture to an object. And I'm not really answering your question. I'm just tooting my own horn right now. So <laughs> the, the thing that I would say is all those buzzwords that I just started with today start with something very simple, man. If you can make a sphere within 3D and you can move around that sphere, make it look like Pac-Man. If you can make Pac-Man, you can make Miss Pac-Man. If you can make Miss Pac-Man, you can make the ghost. If you can make the ghost, you can animate him. You can start getting the mouth to open up. And you can start building your way up in complexity with characters from there. Mm -hmm. Hand skills, man. Hand skills are what it's all about. So being able to go in there and do eye measurements. Um, you know, if you can do a still life really, really well, if you can look at a texture and see what colors are really in this beautiful sauce, you know, that's going to matter. That's going to help you out. And the more you learn, the more you fill your, your mental library up with traditional drawing and design skills, it all applies because that's what this is. You know, there was a time 20, 30 years ago where gaming, computer art, was still very much in the realm of the engineer and the computer scientist. But over these past 20 years, these tools have developed that have given the designers, the creatives, the ability to be able to work within this form. This is how it always goes. And so at this stage, having a strong design background and design foundation is going to do so much uh, for you to be able to like push forward with this and, and really excel at it. You know, always keep going to, the, I know folks that are working for high res and all that, and they still go to character sketching classes. You know, they still do digital paintings on the side, even though their job is a UI UX designer, because all this stuff just feeds, feeds the beast, man. Yeah. yeah. Anything else? What else you got? Yes, sir. Yeah, you had one from a while ago. You held on to it this long? Yeah. All right, what is it? Uh, it was regarding uh, Zebra. Okay. Was it just used for reference in Maya? Oh, great. Okay. So <laughs> it's crazy, right? You do all that work, you get this nice high density model, you make it look beautiful. Because again, imagine if we were doing something that's like a Metal Gear Solid character that's got layers upon layers of detail within it. Then all of a sudden I go in Maya and I'm just destroying all that detail. Right. That doesn't make a lick of sense, right? That is just spinning your own wheels. That's insanity. Yeah. So what you end up doing is you take your high resolution model from ZBrush, bring it into Maya, you're going to do this quad draw process to where you lower the polygons and get the topology, the edge flow working really well, especially around the face. When you move back into Substance Painter, that's going to give you the opportunity now to be able to take that high resolution model. You'll import it into Substance Painter, which is designed to handle, just like ZBrush, these high resolution models in a way that Maya isn't really. And you're going to project that character onto your low poly model. From there, that's when you create that flat map. So the maps work to where gray is neutral. It's completely flat. White is raised. And then the black gives depth to things. So this is just the normal maps are a little bit different. They just add a third color to it. But you're creating a deformation map. So now all those little wrinkles, all those little skin pores that we had on this character previously, it gets applied through this deformation map. And that's what's going to give you that intense detail that we created within ZBrush. Yeah, man. Oh, three in a row. You go first, dear. Okay, yes. Um, do you have any, like, any, like, specific websites or videos or resources as far as learning a new program or learning to draw? Okay, so name something you want a 3D model. All right, so a shelf. That would be hard surface modeling, introduction, type it into YouTube, and you'll find a 45-minute long tutorial that will show you from beginning to end how to be able to move within Maya and to be able to create that. Yeah. So it's the hardest part, right, if you're just trying to get into this, is knowing what the words are. You know what the end result looks like, but you don't know inside this world what people are calling these things. It's that way with any field in design, right? You know how to watch a movie. You know what looks good within cinema, but you don't know what a tracking shot is. You don't know what the f-stop is all about and all these deep technical terms that make your film come to life. And that's what you're lacking right now is really just the, the buzzwords, the vocabulary. So having that, it's called hard surface modeling in, in Maya and an introduction. Now, I was going to bring up, uh, so if you're doing, let's say, a race car or something, I always want to cover it because it's what you suggest. Sponsor logos. Um, like even if you're doing clothing for a character, uh, logos, emblems. 
Yeah. Yeah, if you're doing the Akira jacket. Yeah. Would it make more sense to use that children's illustration of Douglas Scott? Only because art is something that's really graceful. Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, and I don't know if you have Photoshop as part of uh, your phone. And this one, I didn't really have to touch Photoshop at all with it. But yeah, that's certainly a way to be able to do it, and I've done that in the past. So there's a cool thing that you're allowed to do within, uh, within Illustrator that you might not be aware of. You can take that vector information that you create within Illustrator, you can export it, but you have to export it as like an Illustrator version 8. You can't do like Illustrator CC. You have to like back save with an Illustrator. And then you can bring that vector information, those curves from Illustrator, into Maya, and then you've got your entire text, your entire logo, whatever the Akira pill that's on the back of uh, Kaneda's jacket. Yeah. So. Yeah, that, and I will bring that up because some of those things might be hard to create in some standards, especially like the resolution models. Yeah. And it, you realize, hey, I screwed something up. So you do have the ability within Substance Painter to set the resolution of your map. So these were 20, 2048. But you can go as high as you want with them, which will, will help that a lot. But that's going to, of course, add more information and more load time to your character. So it's always a balance between that. Yeah. Yeah. Come to think. I think Substance Painter does allow you to be able to project stickers. I haven't yeah, done it in there yet. But if you've got too low of a resolution, it's not going to look good. You're right. Yeah, yeah man. So we had you, you, sir. We'll go get to you in just a sec. Um, it's kind of an oddball question. So, I'm, sorry. I'm a bit of an oddball myself, so please uh, go ahead. I do a lot of sound design cool. for uh, characters, and one of the difficult things in that whole process is knowing when to start. Uh, you know, even going back to like, the first animation that you see the characters, mm -hmm. um, or even some people like to hear sound being made for a character at a set point. Yeah. So, I think you just taught us all, all a lot about where sound design exists within the character pipeline. I was not aware of that. So, yeah, cool. I am all for it. Start the sound design. Start it all as soon as you possibly can. Yeah, get your storyboards out there. Get your, you know, as soon as you, <laughs> as soon as you get your character designs figured out, go in. Let the background artist go to town. Let the storyboard artist start going. Let the three D modeler start going. Start building all the bits, bobbles, and, and dongles that are going to be in the game. Start your icons and just run it all at the same time <laughs> to be able to get it out on time. Because you're going to have that CEO that comes back three months in and is like, no, it's all wrong. It just doesn't feel right. we got to look at this all over from the start, from the ground up. Now these games are popular. Can we add this feature? And you're like, oh, my God, what are you doing? Let's just launch it. What, what's your question? So I have characters and uh, models, rigs. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm new to animation, so this is all in Maya. Um, cool. How do I, so I have an idle animation, right? So now mm -hmm. I can create a decent animation, essentially. How do I create that second animation without doing my first animation? Open up a new file. New file. Yeah, so you should have a, a base animation. Before you start your animation, your idle animation is called, you know, pip idle 2, right? But then you've got another file before that that's like pit base, and it's just him chilling in his T-pose. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, you're going to go in, and you're going to create that walking that walking animation. It's mm -hmm. going to be something else, idle 3. And then you're going to export each one of those within to Unity so that when you, the player clicks the W button, all of a sudden, we get idle number 2, right? When he clicks right, we get the run. Okay. And so each one of those animations is going to end up playing. Then there's also blend animations that happen between each one of those actions, because you right. can't just have the character all of a sudden idling, and then he's in the running pose. It's going to look really weird. So, okay. lots of little steps. Yes, sir? Um, how many of the description words do you usually work with when you're doing your, uh, like, characters, uh, and all this stuff, like, in your Unity? So, when you're doing, yeah, when you're doing your description for, like, your characters, like, saying, oh, yeah, Oh, that's an interesting point. Um, I would say that it, it's more of an emotional connection that you're trying to build because you are in store for hours upon hours of fun if you want to take this guy all the way to the end of the pipeline. 
So you need to start kind of dating this guy, right? You need to start asking him like who he is. And he's not just dapper. What is he while you're sitting here drawing, you know, you're having little scenarios in your brain. How would he react to this situation? How would he do this? What happens if he gets, what's a negative effect during the game? How does the character react? Does his facade of being this, you know, verbose, like really excitable, like person just completely crumble when something, you know, goes wrong? Or does he maintain his brave right up to the end and defy it, you know, and, and start thinking through him in that way. So it's not a, a word set. It's really just having daydreams. Like that, that's the way that I like to think about it. Yeah. Yes, sir. Um, so from my employer perspective, let's just say you're talking about someone that says you can take these summers. What are some key, let's say, like, like skills or like things that you look for in someone's portfolio really just as a skill set to say like, you know what, I want that guy to have these tools that I need in mm -hmm. order to act in ordinary professional life. Yeah. So like someone that can just like, you know, that can run, but they don't need to have Man, so that depends how much money you have, right? <laughs> I think that's the biggest deal first. Um, you know, if you are a small gaming studio and you're just getting started and you want to bring somebody on, um, you know, look at their portfolio. Right now, I was just having a, a talk earlier today with a former student of mine who was having a lot of trouble um, getting a job outside of school. He's an incredible illustrator. His illustrations are phenomenal. And... But all these other studios that he keeps talking to are saying like, oh, well, why don't you try doing some stuff in our style? And I think that is such a joke. If someone says that to you, they shouldn't be looking at portfolios. Like, if you can't look at someone's art and see from the design perspective and the design skills that it takes, the way that they're handling their rendering, their blending, their shading, their proportions, do the characters have weight? Do they, do they look like they're coming alive on the page? then yes, they probably have the ability to be able to do your style. They can do that. So you're looking for those principles of design, you're looking for that ethos, you're looking for something that really excites you and just makes you move emotionally. And you're looking for the intelligence in a designer. So that's why you know, I said look at references of everything. Because if you're just doing, if you're doing a carrot just out of your head, yeah, it'll look like a carrot. You all know what a carrot looks like. But if you look at references, suddenly you're going to see 200 different representations of what a carrot can be or what a carrot has existed as on the internet. And you're going to add something new to that conversation in the world of carrots. <laughs> so you're going to end up like more complex example, right? We're doing the predator UI on his arm, right? If we start with that and we start drawing it, it's going to look like the 1980s. It's going to have the square buttons on it. It's not going to be very detailed. But all of a sudden, if you start looking at other references, fan art that's been created over the past 20 years, you're going to see that the UI UX, the shapes, the different ways that they think about the screens, the different raised and lowered levels on it, the way that the wires move from one section to the next, even though it's all Fox sci-fi and machinery, and you're going to start to develop a visual vocabulary in your head that is very robust. And when you see something like that, when you see design that's had that kind of consideration given to it, that's who you want to hire. I think that's the best, most honest answer you're going to get through this weekend. You're communicating your design intelligence and, and your, your soul and your breadth and your ability to be able to take a design from start to finish in your portfolio. So make sure you got some smart, unique stuff in there that's going to stand out from the crowd. And I'm not saying do a giant Grim Reaper that's, you know, bloody, he's got skin hanging off of him, unless you don't want to go work for Tripwire. <laughs> uh, then then that, that's where you need to be. That's what needs to be in your portfolio. <laughs> hey, I'm sorry, I'm going to ask the, yes, sir. Uh, so uh, as a voice actor. Yeah, yeah, to answer your question about sound, yeah. When, uh, would you, in the character building process, when would you ideally like to have that conversation or that collaboration? I'd say as soon as possible, yeah. Because, I mean, look, that is one of the most unique things out there right now. When we look at the Overwatch voice actors, and they are freaking rock stars. I've never seen a phenomenon like this happen within gaming before to where people will meet them at these cons, and they're, oh, my gosh, I just met Licio. And it's like, stop it, girl. Like, it's, it's just a voice actor. It's not that big of a deal. Like, you know, the person who does Bart Simpson has done hundreds of different, like, character animations at Dragon Con or character voices over the years, 
they have a very small line, but if Lucio shows up, it's like 300 deep. So we're at a turning point here, and you're in the right field, man, when it comes to voice actors, because people are attaching so much personality, and the game design in that particular game, in that world, they haven't added anything on to the, to the overreaching narrative of Overwatch in over two years. We don't know anything else about Talon. We don't know anything else about like what's going on. They had the comic book. They canceled it. They never took it anywhere. The latest cinematic doesn't give us anything else. But people still love those characters because the design is beautiful and they, each one of them has got a unique voice. So I think that as we move forward, that yeah, character voice acting is going to become more and more important. Yeah. Hey, what you got back there, man? Yeah. Okay, cool. I was going to say, because those two are potato, potato. You could do your, the answer I'm going to give you, um, ZBrush, we traditionally say is best for organic shapes, right? Because it allows you to be able to smooth and do the edges on things. Whereas Maya is much better for hard surface. I would never, some people do do this. The ZBrush purist out there, there are insane people on the internet who will make a Gundam within ZBrush. I would personally never want to do that. Not, not my cup of tea. I'd much rather model that out within Maya, bring it in, do the second layer and third layer of detail within ZBrush. But if it's a hard surface, a man-made object, you're going to do it in Maya, generally. It's a good way to think about it. Or a program like Maya, 3D Studio, Max, Blender, etc. cetera. Um, if you're going to be doing something organic, you want the old man, the wrinkles, uh, you know, you want to see every follicle on Goku's hair, uh, ZBrush is a great spot to be able to paint that stuff in. No, I haven't touched it. Is it pretty cool? Get my pen. I guess. Learning too. Yeah. Oh, I see. Yeah. Is this the one where you can continue to pull it out and then it'll keep adding polygons as you extrude it? Like, yeah, it'll add polygons locally. It's freaking cool. Just, like, yeah. It's applied all over. And that's really cool. Especially yeah. if you mess something up and it's like, ah, man, I screwed this up. I want to go and just like erase it. And you can do that and then read the part of the text. It's such a time save. That's dope. Yeah, they were. I saw that at like one of the previews like a couple years ago uh, within Maya. And saw them trying to like add that, or it might have been like Cinema 4D or something, one of these okay. programs. But I'm glad it finally made it into ZBrush. They haven't added it in there yet. As far as like the hard surface stuff that you're talking about, with live bullying, I think that helps considerably. I'd still use probably Maya for blocking out template shapes because it can just do it a lot faster. Um, yeah. Definitely like live bullying. So, in other words, if you make a cut, you know how you normally, if you're going into Maya or mm -hmm. whatever, you're basically locked into that. Yeah. It's like, Mm -hmm. Live bullying, it's like, oh, I can rescale this, I can drag this over and it updates on the fly. Yeah. And that's so useful with the game, especially in a hard surface game. Mm -hmm. so. Certainly, man, yeah. yeah. That's the cool thing about it, right? So you've got Photoshop, you've got Illustrator, you've got an art director who's going to say, we need this by the end of the week. And a lot of times your job becomes, how can I get this product out there as quickly as possible to the highest degree and highest level? And that's where the, the creative part comes into it because I could... If I'm a 2D illustrator, I could make it within Illustrator, or I could paint the same thing within Photoshop. Each one is going to have a different pipeline. There's going to be a different solution. You can get to the same final way, but a lot of times it's about understanding which is going to be the fastest, which is going to be the simplest, which is one that's going to be able to allow me to be able to edit later on down the line. And that's just something that you kind of, but you can still get to the creative, the final creative outcome in, in a couple different ways. So. Yeah, that's the way. That's the way that I took it on this one. So, yeah, I love where we're at with this stuff. Yes. So, um, when you made that with the characters or um, you know, artwork, other you know other work that you've maybe designed within, um, stuff, <laughs> um, do you ever like run into a problem where programmers are like, this file, this is way too big, or the game is crashing and not loading at this point, and if you do, or do you like let them handle that? Or if they let me, you handle that for me, where do you fix that issue? 
that would be a technical director's thing, uh, and they might send it back to you and say, hey, you know, we have a problem with this, and then you're going to spend an afternoon going through and checking all the vertices and make sure there's no faces over top of each other and nothing's been, you know, duplicated or that your texture has been actually compressed and it's the right size for your game. Uh, there's a whole plethora of different things, and really that's, when you do this stuff long enough, right, all these crazy stuff that I just described today start to become second nature. And the stuff that keeps you coming back to it are these problems, like the problem solving part of working with technology and still trying to be creative. And when you get this stuff, it becomes sort of the, the scientific method. You've got a lot of variables that can be going wrong, and you'll just kind of go through and start testing where you think it, it, it might be breaking to sort of figure it out and be able to improve it. But there's entire teams that'll go through and, and check games and try and break them just for that reason. So, guys, it is 3 o'clock. We're done here. I hope you enjoyed yourselves and learned something. Thank you for listening. Yes. <laughs>